Okay, here she is, the little superstar. Are you a superstar? So I wanted to say hi. Um, good morning from Ruffy. We are both still totally excited with the news. And I have so many questions from social media yesterday that I just figured I would film a little video answering all your questions. That way we can all learn. And um, of course, if you have questions, you can DM me on Instagram or you can just respond to stories. Um, if you haven't looked through the highlight, uh, puppies highlight on Ruffy's account yet, go ahead and do that. It's so cute to see Giovanni. It's really cute to see our trip to Salt Lake City. Um, okay, go. Go play. So there's a lot of information on Instagram, and then there's also a lot of information on Ruffy's website, which is linked in the bio. So by far the funniest thing about yesterday is that a number of people, I'm not talking one or two, like maybe 10 or 15 people <laughs> responded, oh my goodness, this is such a nice surprise, and are you so shocked? As I said in an earlier video, I'm not shocked. <laughs> it's not a surprise. It's not a dog park faux pas. Um, I've been planning to breed Ruffy for a couple of years now and did a lot of research around um, how to breed, how it's different now versus, you know, for some of us, I'm an 80s child. So dog breeding in the 80s and 90s is quite a bit different than it is today. Today, it resembles more of the entire human fertility process. So if any of you have gone through fertility, it's very simple and it's very similar. Um, there are also advances in, medis in medicine, in veterinarian care, but also in the amount of information we have in terms of chromosome data. And so that makes dog breeding at this point really, really quite different from the 80s and the 90s. And I guess the early 2000s, although I wasn't in this space then. Uh, I grew up in Colorado where we, there was about 50 people in my high school graduating class. It was a very rural area. We all had animals. Um, my father grew up on a farm in Tennessee. He had animals and cows and horses. So Colorado is a little different in that you learn how to interact with animals in a different way. And of course the breeding process back then was more um, as you would expect on a farm or as you'd expect um, kind of in family home breeders. Hi, what are you saying? You want to be on camera? Ruffy's barking to come back up. <laughs> so this process was really different. Um, I had started researching how to breed and what I'd like to see in Ruffy if she were to, if she were to have puppies. So I'm, I waited for Ruffy for a very long time. I knew that she was going to be around 13 or 14 pounds. I wanted to be able to travel with her. I wanted to be able to take her on the plane, which means under 15 pounds. And you can put her right on the plane and in the seat in front of you. And she travels so well. We just have our little carrier for her. Oh, was that a kiss? Did you give me a kiss? <laughs> so that was the first thing. And I waited a very long time to find the correct breeder, and then once that was put into place, I made sure Ruffy had the correct size, the correct fur, temperament. She has a golden retriever temperament. Um, if you can see, her fur is non-shedding and fairly straight. I also really wanted this color. So <clears throat> from what I have learned, if anyone out there is a veterinarian who has information otherwise, please, um, please respond. However, from what I've learned, there's a poodle gene where the, the fur of the dog becomes lighter and blonder as time goes on. And oftentimes in the past, we didn't know how to isolate this gene. I chose Ruffy because of this particular um, gene. So she started off a very, very apricot rusty color, which I think you can, I think you can see even darker than this. And then as time has gone on, she's gotten really quite light. At this point, you can see she's actually like a blonde brown. There's some other photos in the feed where you can really see zoomed in on her fur and see what it looks like. 
So Ruffy was very apricot rusty when she was born. And then over the last two years, she's turned into this brown blonde, kind of like that classic color, like a brown melange. And the other thing I wanted to find, but also needed to find with Ruff is hypoallergenic. So I have autoimmune and I needed a dog that was non-shedding. And also I needed a dog that I wasn't going to react to because if anyone knows anything about autoimmune, you know that you react to basically everything in the home. So it was very important to me to find Ruff, her size, her fur, the color orientation, the, the waviness, the straightness, the color of her eyes, um, the extent to which her fur would be triggering for me in terms of autoimmune. Now, that's a very big discussion in the dog breeding world. Um, one thing I've noticed is that people talk about F1B and people talk more about lineage in terms of the extent to which the dog is going to be hypoallergenic. All dogs are going to shed, but there's a lot of information online about what order and how many times the dogs have been bred from either a doodle, a doodle with a doodle, a poodle and a retriever. Um, so there's differences in terms of the extent to which they're going to be hypoallergenic the further down on the line of ancestry that you go. So Ruffy was bred from two doodles and that made me happy because I thought, oh, okay, great. Then chances are that she'll be a little bit less hypoallergenic. Let's take your sweater off. You feel kind of hot. You feel a little hot. So those are the reasons that I chose Ruffy. Um, I love to travel. I travel for a lot of the years. She comes with me. 